house of the Lord. I want you to go ahead and put your hands together if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen, amen, amen. It's so good to see you. I am always so excited to give the word of God. This, this word right here has the power to transform our lives and has the power to cut through anything that we might be dealing with, anything we might be struggling with. I just believe in this word with all of my heart. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Elliot. My wife, Tiffany, and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Give it up for yourselves one time, Lifeline Church. Welcome everybody online too. I'm so glad to see you here today. Well, I'm not seeing you, but you're seeing me. I'm glad you can see me. You're already part of this family, and I just love it. I just love it so much. So as we're getting started today, I want to hit you with... Um, Instead of a joke, I'd rather give you some sobering truths. Um, I was doing some research. I was doing some research this last week, and I discovered that a study done by the National Association of Health four years ago, 2014, discovered that 21.5 million people in America struggle with some kind of substance abuse disorder. 21.5 million. At the time the study was done, there was 318 million people in the states. That translates to about just under 7% of people struggling with a substance abuse issue. That's pretty high. I don't know about you, but I think it's too high. I think that's real high. And my story is, is that I was one of those 7%. I was one of those 7 percenters. Let me just give you a, another, little, another little fact here. Um, the amount of people every single day, every day that die due to drug-related uh, overdose. So not just die in any way, but the ones that just overdose and die, the number is 175 people every single day. Today, well, those numbers were four years ago. Do you think the number's gone up or down since then? Uh, I'm, an, I'm an optimist myself. I believe, you know, things are getting better. You know, we're doing good. But, hey, we live in San Joaquin County, all right? So let's, let's, let's have the eyes to see what's, what's really going on here. 175 people every single day are dying from overdose. You know what that looks like? That looks like a 737 jet crashing and burning, and the pilot, the flight attendants, and all the passengers die Every single day. Let me tell you something. If that, if that happened, if that happened, the airports would all be shut down. Would all be shut down. Every single day that happens. But this is happening every single day. But the issue isn't flight, isn't airplanes going down. It's that people are struggling and broken and in bondage to things like alcohol, drugs, prescription drugs, and other substances. And like I said, that's, that's my story. I was one of the 7%. Praise God, I didn't die, though. My story is that someone introduced me to a man named Jesus Christ who has the power to save, and I happened to just believe in his word and believe in his message, and I came into a community like this one who loved me, cared for me, took care of me, showed me how to live this life, and by God's grace, I confessed my sin to him, and he is, let me just tell you, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. Now, I don't care if you're struggling with substance abuse. I don't care if you know somebody struggling with substance abuse, I don't care what your issue is today, Jesus has the answer. Jesus has the answer. I don't care what that issue is. Maybe you're feeling depressed. Maybe you're feeling out of sorts. Maybe you are struggling with substance abuse. Let me just tell you, Jesus is the answer. He's the answer no matter what problem it is. Now, I told you my story a little bit, but let me tell you about my dream. See, this, this issue is near and dear to my heart because... That's what I dealt with. That's what I struggled with. I struggled with addiction coming up. I, I struggled with, with, with substance abuse problems. So, of course, this is near and dear to my heart. But let me tell you something. I, I have a dream, a literal dream that God placed in my heart, the dream of a threefold recovery center with detox, rehabilitation, and transitional living, at the heart of which is a spirit-filled, passionate, outreach-oriented church that serves as community for the region. That's my dream. But let me tell you something. I'm not the only one with dreams. I happen to know for a fact that, that I'm not the only one with dreams. In fact, you have dreams too. I know you do. 
I know you do because God works the same in me as he does in you. And he's given you ideas and thoughts and passions and gifts and talents. Maybe it's been a while since you thought about that dream. But I'm willing to bet my next paycheck that there was a time in your life when you wanted to do something that was unique and special. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it was open a coffee shop or maybe you wanted to open a law firm or maybe you wanted to do the food thing or giving away food at the food bank or maybe you wanted to be able to solve world hunger, whatever it is. It's not that I don't care what it is. I do care what it is. All I'm saying is that Jesus does that. He gives us vision and dreams. And the thing about my dream, the dream of a threefold recovery center, that See, that's, that's unique to me being the, the pastor of, of a church because my dream serves as a platform for your dream. That's why I said I, I don't care what it is, what it is that God has put in your heart to do. I believe that this, this dream, the dream of this local church growing into something like that, there is a place for you to function in your dream and partner it with what's going on here. My dream is a platform for yours. That when we start this thing, that when we do this threefold rehabilitation program, that no matter what it is in your heart to do, whatever specific unique thing that you want to do, imagine it. We send people through this program with detox, rehabilitation, transitional living. Where do you think they're going to go to work? They're going to go to work in your dream. We're going to take the people that nobody wants, turn them into the people that everybody wants, and then the world is going to be like, gimme, 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 gimme. No thanks. We've got it all set up right here. We've got a place for them to go, and we believed in them before you did. So they're ours. That's what happened with me. I was rearing to go. I had dreams in my heart. I had, I had certain gifting, certain talents, but the only people that believed in me were the people right here in this church. The people right here, the pastor of this church, the people in this church said, no, you are, they spoke things to me that we believe in you. We care about you. We want to show you a new way to live. We want to do this with you. And so can you imagine if we had a program like this? You, you know what 7% translates into in just Lodi? Just Lodi, there's 60,000 people. In the greater San Joaquin area, there's about a million people. But let's talk about just little Lodi for a second. You know what 7% looks like? 4,500 people. 4,500 people today, and that is a small guess because that was four years ago. You think that substance abuse issues have gotten smaller or more? You don't have to answer. We're all optimists here. 4,500 people. Those are the people that nobody wants. Those are the people that nobody believes in. What if we stepped in and said, we'll take them. We'll take them right here. Because we know what can happen when we speak truth, when we speak life, and we speak love into people struggling with all the issues of life. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing when God puts a dream in our heart, and then we begin to act on it. That's the name of today's message is from dream to reality. I want to help today. I want to walk through a story in the Bible out of Luke 10. You can go ahead and turn there if you want. We're going to read there in just a second. In Luke 10, it's the, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. The story of the Good Samaritan. You may have heard it before. But I believe in those verses from, from verse 30 to 37, there is a three-step process. There's a step-by-step -step process in which we take the lowest hurting person and we take them step by step, and it's our part. It's what we do. It's what we do. Because at the end of the day, it's up to people to make their own decisions, to do what they, what they want to do, what they say they can do. But on our side, on our end, we can do what we can do. So let's start. Let's start in God's word. Luke 10, Luke 10, starting in verse 30. God's word is amazing, and I love it. And you know what? No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're dealing with today, the answer is right here. The answer is right here. Whatever you need, whatever you're struggling with, the answer can be found right here. So let's start by, by doing this. Let's just pray. Father, I pray for open hearts. I pray for soft hearts that are like good soil that would take this word in and let, uh, let something beautiful grow. Lord, I, I pray that as we listen to your word today, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and show us exactly what we need to hear. I'm about to say a lot of words right now. The Holy Spirit, I invite you to, to speak through my words and speak directly into what people are going through and struggling with or are dreaming today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. So let's start. Let's start in verse 30. Here we go. Jesus replied with a story. Now, 
You remember last week, if you tuned in last week, if you were here, if you were listening online, we talked about this religious leader, this religious lawyer who wanted to ask Jesus a question and was trying to, it was trying to, they were always trying to get through to him. They were always trying to mix him up and shake him up. And so they asked him this question, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded with a question. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Can't you just answer? No. He responds with a question and says, how do you read it? How do you read your word? And what do you say that the scripture says is the greatest commandment? And the, the religious guy responded, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, yes, do this and you will live. But then... The man wanted to justify his actions, so he said, who is my neighbor? You'll remember from last week that we said that Jewish people, how can I put this sensitively? They were a little racist. They were a little, they were, they were a little self-indulgent and with good reason. God told them, you are my chosen people. This race, the Jewish nation, you are my people. The Messiah is going to come through you. You have the law. You have the way to life. You have the one true God. So, yeah, they were a little bit like, we got this. So the, the Jewish man probably thought, and it was very right. If you tuned in last week, we talked all about that through Scripture, that they, they thought that Jews, people like them, were their neighbor. But Jesus responds with this story, which is so powerful in so many different ways. He replied with the story. Pray for your pastor that he would be a better storyteller because Jesus talked to his stories, and he was, the, he was the man. People loved it. So pray for your pastor that he would tell better stories because everyone will be better because of that. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. Let's stop right there for just a second because I want to tell you about this man. This man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Let me just tell you that this man, a Jewish man, the man who apparently had all of his stuff together, you know, Jews had all their stuff, you know, they got the law, the Messiah's coming through them, they're God's chosen people, but this man was either stupid, arrogant, or he was dealt a bad hand in life. I'll tell you why. Because the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho was saturated with bandits, thieves, and robbers. It was not uncommon for every single traveler on that road from Jerusalem down to Jericho to go in big groups so they'd be safe. So this man was traveling alone, which Jesus' listeners would know that was weird. That right there, you know what that's like saying? That's like saying there was a man who was traveling down Wilson Way at 3 in the morning with $100 bills hanging out of his pocket. And we would all think, well, that guy's either stupid or he's arrogant. Bring it on. Bring it on. I can take him. I can take him. So he's either stupid, arrogant, or he was left in a very bad position where he had no other choice. Right? That's where this man was. Stupid, arrogant, or dealt a bad hand, had no other choice. But let me tell you what else we can discern from this story. No matter how you got to your turmoil, no matter how you got to where you're at, maybe there's a hard place in your life or you see someone else with a hard place in life, no matter how you got there, whether stupid, arrogant, or dealt a bad hand, we all deserve mercy. We all deserve mercy. You know, Jesus doesn't say whether he was stupid, arrogant, or just dealt a bad hand. He just said it happened. And so no matter how we find ourselves in that place or the people around us, no matter how they find themselves in that place, it's not our job to assign blame, stupid, arrogant, or dealt a bad hand. It's not, that's, everyone deserves mercy just like this man deserved mercy. And he didn't deserve mercy and we don't deserve mercy and people who are stupid, arrogant, or dealt a bad hand don't necessarily inherently deserve mercy. That's God's standard. God says they deserve mercy. They can have mercy if they want it. That's, that's from God. That's the first thing we can discern from this story. I know it's a long story, but I can, I can just take that one verse and be like, I'm good. That's good enough for me. But we're going to keep going. By chance, a priest came along. When he saw the man lying there, he crossed by the other side, the road, and passed by. A, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. So these two guys both worked in the church. A priest and a temple assistant, a pastor and a worship leader, 
Uh, we're walking down the road. They walked into a bar. Bartender said, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go that way. So there's a, there's a priest and a temple assistant. They both work in the church. But, but here's the thing. In those times with the temple, so they called the churches uh, the temple or the synagogue. And they worked there. And, but here's the difference. Um, there was a lot of different ways that you could become unclean. Touching a corpse was one of them. Or getting blood on you or touching someone with leprosy. There's a lot of ways you could become unclean. And if you became unclean, even if you're a priest, even if you're a temple assistant, you are not allowed in. You have to become unclean. Or, I mean clean. You're unclean. You have to become clean. That means you have to go through all of these little ceremonies. You have to wait outside the camp. You have to do this, that, and the other thing. So they may have been worried about Oh, man, I'm a priest, man. I can't afford not to be able to go up into church. It's not like, you know, me. If I see somebody and I accidentally touch somebody, you aren't going to be like, oh, he's unclean. He's unclean. He's not allowed in. But for Jews, that was, that was God's law. Like, you can't come in here unclean. It was talking about speaking to the holiness of God. But let me tell you something. Coming from Jerusalem down to Jericho, church was over. The temple was in Jerusalem. So they were coming from church. They didn't have to worry about it. I can hear myself echoing in the back. It's really crazy. They were coming down from church, so they didn't even have to worry about that. But here's the person right here, and they're like, ooh, spin move. I don't even want to get near that, man. I'm not trying to get unclean or anything. Whoa, spin move. You, but you and me would never do that, would we? Oh, no. We wouldn't see anybody on the side of the road or in downtown Lodi when we're walking by. And we see them up the street. They're on this side. And then we look this way and we're like having this. Now I'm going to have a really intense conversation with my neighbor over here. And if I hear anybody talking from over here, I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear them. No, we would never do that. And then driving in our car when somebody's sitting there with a sign and we're like, oh, I have to check my phone over here because it's uncomfortable. It's, a, it's an awkward situation to be like, oh my gosh, you are struggling right now, and I just don't know what else to do about it. Now, this is not a message only about the homeless. This is not a message only about, only about um, the drug addictive. I want, I want to get that across right now, that there are CEOs of companies that are hurting on, uh, on the road, so to speak, and we could be like, oh, it's been move awkward. I don't really want to. It's just uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for us. And so Jesus is talking about that. But then a despised Samaritan came along. You remember when I said that the Jews were, forgive me, Lord, a little bit racist in their dealings where Jews, like, we are it. We are solid. We are good. We got the law. So they didn't look too favorably on Gentiles, Gentiles is basically any, any other nation other than the Jewish nation. But even worse than that was an abomination or a twisting of, of who they are. A Samaritan is like half Jew, but not all the way. It's twisted. It's different, okay? So it was like, you know, it actually, it, you know what it looks like? It looks like, you know, the racism that we've dealt with. The racism that we've dealt with in our country, that has been like a stain on American culture and society. You've seen people deal with, you know, there's one thing to keep everything separate, but then there, when, when there was blending, the really racist people would, would frown upon that. It was that kind of same thing. So the, the listeners would understand that when he's telling this story. Samaritans, they hated them. They hated them. They would avoid their cities. They would avoid their clans. They would avoid all of that so they could stay away from them. So the listeners would understand that. But that's something we just gloss over really fast. So a Samaritan, the story of the good Samaritan to a Jew, it's like, ugh, the story of, you know, the good evil person, which is just hard to understand. A despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him. Everybody say, going over to him. Going over him. Say it louder. Going over, to him. going over to him. Going over to him. The Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to the inn where he took care of them. Let me tell you something about you that you can learn from this story. You are equipped. Whether you have oil and bandages and a donkey, you don't have any of those things right now. But let me just tell you something. When you encounter a hurt, lost and lonely person, you are equipped 
to deal, you are equipped to deal with that person by encouraging them with love, encouraging them with your words and saying, you know what? I believe in you. I care about you. I'm thinking about you. Your words can be a healing agent to that person. You are equipped. You are equipped to help a hurting person. If you would just see, have compassion, and go over to a person. See, have compassion, and go over to a person. It's, it's really that simple. It's that simple. So the next day, he took him to the inn, and the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. I think this is when Jesus lost his audience right there. You know, all the Pharisees and all the Jews were like, hang on to your wallets. Here comes the preacher, and he's starting to talk about money. Ladies, hold on to your purses. Here he comes. You know, so Jesus lost his audience right there. If he didn't lose them before, he lost them right there. But this is what, I, this is what I've learned about Jesus in the long term, okay? This is what I've learned. Jesus loved to make people mad. <laughs> He would talk about things that irritated people. You know, it's like Easter time. Easter comes, you know, I'm preaching your best life now. And I'm preaching the most encouraging stuff I can. But when Jesus has a big crowd, he's like, he has his biggest crowd with him. Tens of thousands of people are listening. Hmm, this seems like a good time to tell people to drink my blood. This seems like a good time to tell people to eat my flesh. Oh, I got my biggest crowd? Let's talk about money and sex. Let's talk about that. All right, are we ready? All right, got my biggest crowd here. Better keep them. Who's having extramarital sex? Anybody? Let's have a show of hands. Anybody? And everybody leaves. But it seems to me that Jesus was like, he loved that. You know why? He's just like, well, let me just, let me just, let me just sort through right now and see who's really involved. Let me just see who really wants to take up their cross. Let me just see who is really interested. Now, I, I'd never do that. I would never do that. I love you, care about you. You could never do anything wrong in my eyes. You're so good, so encouraging. But Jesus seemed to love to talk to you about the hard stuff. And he loves to talk to me about the hard stuff, like money, like money, for example. So the thing about giving money is this. Um, have you ever felt weird about giving somebody money who was struggling, like maybe on the side of the road. Let's, let's go back to the homeless thing real fast. Or somebody struggling with drug addiction. They, they call you or you see them and then they ask for some money or they are ask, they're got a sign or something. Have you ever felt weird about giving money to that person? Yeah, you have. It's all right. You don't have to say so. I know you do. But let me just tell you that biblically, it seems like Jesus is trying to teach us that the Samaritan didn't just throw change at the hurting person on the ground. No. What did, the, what did the Samaritan do? He invested towards an organization that was helping people that he wanted to help. It's like the Samaritan said, I'm not equipped to take care of this person overnight. I'm not equipped. I, I'm not even at my house, so I'm going to give my money to the inn so that the innkeeper can take care of them. Let me just tell you something that I believe. I believe the local church is the inn. The local church is the inn where people are cared for. It was always designed to be like this, and this is what I believe. That the local church, by, intended by God, was always intended to be the source of help for the community. It wasn't supposed to be welfare. It wasn't supposed to be financial aid. No, it was supposed to be the local church took care of everybody, and everybody took care of the local church. It was supposed to be a symbiotic relationship with the community and the local church. By design, that was the way it was intended to be. But along the way, you know, we're people and things get broken. People bet betray trust. And so people stop wanting to do that. And then the church isn't able to do the things that it's all cracked up to supposed to do. And then people lose even more trust. And then it's, it's just like this big circle that just spins out of control and people lose faith. And I understand that. Let me tell you. But Jesus isn't afraid to talk about it, so neither should I. And I want to let you know that one of the things that we need to learn is that we shouldn't, just be, we shouldn't just be seeing the need, feeling compassion, but we should also be willing to, to invest to help someone get the help that they need. Now, Jesus goes on. Jesus goes on to say, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. 
Let me tell you the story in a, in, a more, in a more relevant term. You are driving home from work. It's a back road, and it's late at night, okay? You're driving down the road, and a car is in front of you. They start to slow down. So you are forced to slow down. Next thing you know, a car is beside you. So you can't get away. You're kind of pinned in, and these two cars have gone burp and locked you in. So now you're slowed down enough. Someone leaps out of the car, smashes your window open, and pulls you out of your own car. You are terrified and shocked. They take your purse. They take your wallet. They take your phone. They take your backpack filled with stuff. They beat you, leave you on the side of the street, and they leave in your car. And next thing you know, you are left on the side of the road, carless, phoneless, moneyless, bloody, and, and all tore up, and they leave you next to a tent and a shopping cart that just happens to be right there, and that is your night. There you are. You are stranded, and you can't believe what just happened to you. Next thing you know, you hear a rustling from the tent. You hear a rustling from the tent, and you think, my night's about to get worse. <laughs> Someone's about to come out of that tent and get me. So you hear the, you hear the rustling, and you play dead at that point. You play dead, and you hear a shaky, scared voice say, is anybody there? And then you hear, the, you see these two big eyes like dinner plates peek out of the tent. Anybody there? Let me tell you, that person is more scared than what you think right now. And they come out of the tent, and they see you standing, well, laying there. And they come over to you. They put blankets. They take all their stuff out of the shopping cart, put blankets down in the cart. With all their strength, lift you into their shopping cart, cover you with their sleeping bag. And they start pushing you to Lodi Memorial, excuse me, Adventist Health. They start pushing you down there to the hospital leaving their stuff to probably be stolen by other homeless people. They leave their stuff there and begin pushing you. And not only that, they wait for you to get checked in because it takes a long time sometimes to get checked in. And they wait for you. That's the story Jesus told. D Jesus didn't tell a story of a Jewish person being nicer. He told a story of someone who supposedly doesn't have any kind of truth in their life being more of a neighbor than people who claim to have the truth. That is the story that Jesus told. He told a story that was so offensive and so shocking that we claim to know the truth. We claim to have these answers. And Jesus tells a story that says, well, you see those people you don't even respect. You see those Muslims over there? See those East Indians over there? They're being more neighborly than you are. Who do you think was a neighbor to the person in that moment? And you can't even say the words. You say, uh, they are. That's the story Jesus told them. What I think we can discern from this story right now is three action steps that we can take to be a lifeline in our community. Three action steps, because I have not done my job unless I've given you something to do. Action step number one, are you ready for this? It's in your bulletin. Please write it down if you are taking notes. It's pray to see the need. Pray to see the need. Because some of us, man, we just don't even want to see the need, right? Right? I mean, we, we can, we, can, we kind of see it over there, but we look the other way. We don't want to see it because it hurts. It hurts to see people hurting. And it hurts to see the need that is really out there. But remember what Jesus said about the Samaritan. He saw the man and felt compassion for him. Sometimes God will lay a big old dream in your heart when you see a need. It's when God opened my eyes to see a great need in our community that's when God birthed something wonderful, a big dream in my heart, is when I saw the need. And if we don't see the need, we'll never recognize our responsibility, our response, something that we can do to make a difference in our community if we never see the need. Check this out in 2 Kings. I've got a really cool story for you in 2 Kings chapter 6, a story about a man named Elisha, not to be confused with Elijah. I think God did that just to confuse us. Really weird, Elijah, and then Elisha was his protege. It's like, come on, God, can you, like, space it out a little bit? You can, like, space these two out. But Elisha was really awesome, twice as many miracles as his, as his former. But the story goes like this. They're, they're in a battle, and a younger man sees that they are surrounded by enemies. The story goes like this, starting in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir. What will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Elisha was a prophet, and Elisha was known for doing big, crazy miracles and coming through 
big time in the 11th hour. So he's crying out to him, wouldn't you? I would. Be like, Elisha, man, do something. Man, show me something. And this is what Elisha responded with. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. You know, sometimes I feel like, Lord, why did you even give me this big old dream? I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's, I've got million dollar vision for this church. And let me tell you, that scares some people and it scares me too to have vision that big. And it can be a little discouraging at times and go, God, what are you, why would you even tell me that if you're not going to come through? But let me tell you, I want, I want to see what God sees. And God showed me what he saw, and it was big, and it was wonderful, and we outnumber them. If we would just pray, just take this one step, maybe this is your step to take. Pray to at least have God open your eyes to see that there is a need in our community, and it's not just homelessness. It's not just drug addiction, even though there are 4,500 people struggling with drug addiction right now. Now, and they are your brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and friends and family. I, I know you all know somebody who's struggling with this. So this is one need that I think we all can see. But God has put a dream in your heart that he wants to make a reality. And for, and for us to take our step is we have to see the need so that it can become a reality. So we pray to see the need. Step number two is this. Write this down in your bulletin as well. I want you to get this. I want you to know it. Find your fit. I want you to find your fit in the body of Christ. Remember that Jesus told this story about the Samaritan, that he had the olive oil to soothe the wounds. He had the bandages. He had the donkey. And like I said, you are equipped. You have a fit. You have something in you that is unique and special, and we are made up like a body. You know, this, this church, every church, the whole church, the big church, is designed like a body. And every single body part that you have is important. If you don't believe me, lose your pinky toe and tell me what that makes you feel. It's like a little part like this big, but you'd be stumbling around all over the place without it. Let me, let me talk to you a little bit up in, second, in um, Romans 12 about how the body of Christ is supposed to be just that, a body. Romans 12, let's start this off in... Let me see, verse 4. Let's start it in verse 4. Paul says this in the book of Romans. For just as our bodies have many parts, and each part have a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Actually, I'm going to stop right there. We all belong to each other, and we all have a special place that we belong. I want you to find your fit. There are people right now going through growth track in that back room, and it's, today is step two. It's spiritual gifts assessment, temperament assessment. Like we have these tests and these resources to help you find your fit. The way to find your fit in the body of Christ, at least here, is to go through growth track. Go through, go through growth track, find out what your gifts are, find out what your talents are, find out what God has made you to do, and then just start walking in that. It's simple. It doesn't have to be as grandeur because when the dream is too big, then we just don't do anything about it. But when we just take one step at a time, then it becomes something we can do. Something you can do is you can pray for eyes to see the need and you can find your fit. And thing number three, where Jesus lost his audience, I would love for you to, to take the step of giving. Now, giving is a big step for a lot of people. And I understand in our society, in our culture, it's just, it's one of those subjects you know, they don't struggle with this as much as we do in our society, but we do struggle with it. So I want to acknowledge that, first of all. But Jesus addressed it, and I'm going to address it too. Remember that Jesus said the Samaritan gave two silver coins. It's like that man could have stayed there for a while on that. He invested into a strategic place. It was never intended to just stop at seeing the need, feeling compassion, and finding your fit. No, you, Jesus is saying, I want you to put your money where your mouth is too. I want you to put your money where your mouth is too. Listen to this in Malachi 3, verse 10. Now, this is a scripture 
that a lot of preachers use to try and get people to give. And this is a scripture that God gave Malachi to try and get them to give too. So it's something that has been going on for thousands of years. Um, it's not unique to us at all. But this is what I want to do. I want to shed some new light on this because I think a lot of people have missed the point in giving. And I want to correct that thinking today. Verse 10, Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithes in the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. And this is what most of us focus on. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's army, I will throw open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Now, this is what a lot of preachers preach because they're, they're doing their best. And they're saying, hey, you can put God to the test. And God pinned himself into a corner right there saying, you can test me in this. But imagine, imagine, just think with me. Don't, you don't have to check your brain at the door. I want you to think about this for a second. If I only told people to give because of the benefits that you would receive, and there are benefits to receive from giving. He who sows much will also reap much. That's, that's obvious. It's true. But think about it. If I only told people to give because of the reward they would get, what am I actually teaching? I'm teaching selfishness. Give to get. I'm going to give, yeah, because, ooh, there's a prize waiting for me. Yeah, I'll give because, ooh, there's something waiting for me. There are people that literally think this way, and it works because God has bound himself to his word to honor and bless the tithes and offerings. But this is what I want to point out to you. Why, why, why did Malachi say that we should give? Why? Go ahead. You say it. Why? Why did he say it? Why did he say we should give somebody, please? So that there will be enough food in the house. Give so that somebody will be taken care of. It's exactly what the Samaritan did in the story. Give so that hurting people will be taken care of. Don't give for yourself. Don't give for selfish reasons. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to seasoned givers today. So if you've been given for a while, I want to speak to that. Um, check your heart when you're given your next little something, something. Is it out of routine? Is it out of, well, I need to do this so that my job is safe and so that my income is safe? Or is, or is the real motive that we should have is I'm, I'm giving this so that there will be food in the house so that people will be taken care of. Now, when we walk through those three steps, it's a lot like, it's a lot like we're uh, either building a house or we're, uh, we're, we're making a milkshake or we're making a smoothie. The first step is this. I want to pray for the eyes to see the need. Now, when we see the need and feel compassion, it's the flavor, baby. It's the flavor. When, when we see the need and feel the compassion, that's the, that's the warm, fuzzy part. That's the part that really tastes good. So let's go ahead and add that in first because I don't know about you, but I like I like my smoothies to be full of flavor. And so let's do that. And then when we, take, when we take the next step of finding our fit, finding our fit, this is the ice, the ice, and the, the thing that really gives what we do texture. It gives a texture. And then finally, when we take the step of giving, that my ice melted. I don't know if you saw that. It was way melted. It's going to be good anyways, I bet you. But when we take the step of giving, that's what makes the combination really rich. And gives it that nice, full feeling. So let's see what happens here. And I, in first service, man, I was, really, I was really iffy. So I want to go ahead and put this on right away. So that I don't, this is not the splash zone. This front row is not the splash zone. I actually want to see what goes on here. I'm going to hold it down with my arm, my whole weight. Because when we take these three steps, when we take these three steps and actually put into practice the things that we do in the Word, I mean, when you read your Bible... And when you come to church to hear a message, if it stops with that, you ain't getting this. You came and you saw this, you're like, ooh, nice smoothie, and then left. And you're like, I wonder what that tastes like. I just want to tell, man, I'm, that's plenty. Okay, come on. Come on, thing. this thing is good, though. What is this, a Vita, Vita mix? Nice, classy. I'm going to get one of these for later. I might just do this. When you come to church and when you actually, when you're reading your Bible at home and when, you're, when you get these truths in you, 
it's important to act on them. It's important to take these next steps because that's when your faith becomes real. Now, which one of these is for drinking? This one right here looks good. Ooh, that's milky. I just want to taste. I just want to taste because what good is making a milkshake? What good is doing all this if you don't even get to taste it? Oh, that's fire, baby. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to save this for later. I'm actually starting to get hungry. So I, want, I did this so that you would remember the three ingredients to turning dream into reality because I know you have dreams. I know you have God-given vision because we're created in the image of God to do amazing, wonderful, and powerful things. Every single one of you here today, you all have it in you. You have things that God has spoken to you that he does not intend to speak to me because God has a dream for your life. You know the verse that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? He absolutely does. But it's only when we put these things we've learned today into practice, when we, when we ask God to open our eyes to see the need. When we ask, when we take the next step and go through growth track the way we do it here, go through growth track and find your fit and start acting like a part of the body of Christ. And when you take the step of giving, and man, that's when it really lights up. That's when it really lights up. So let me just go ahead and finish like this. I want to let you know that we have this little saying around here. And if you follow me on social media at all, you'll know that I use uh, Be a Lifeline, a little hashtag, Be a Lifeline. I use that a lot. It's our little slogan. I don't know slogan or a mantra, I don't know what it is, but let me just explain it to you right now, is that we call ourselves Lifeline Church, and we never intended for you to come and just to watch the show and to maybe give a little contribution or to maybe just say, oh, amen at the right time, raise your hand, and so that you could help the Lifeline. No, when you show up and you are a part of this church, you are the solution. You are the Lifeline. Because people tend to think about the church in an objective way. It's like, oh, the church is over there. But the church is right here. It is me. It is you. It is us. We are the church. So when I say that the local church is the hope of the world, I'm saying you are the hope of the world. That when you do these three things, ask God to open your eyes to see hurting people. To see hurting wealthy people or hurting poor people. When you find your fit in the body of Christ, that's when you are being a lifeline. Be a lifeline. Don't just come to church. I watched this really cool message uh, by a really popular preacher. Uh, it's called Stop Going to Church. Biggest church in the whole United States preached a series called Stop Going to Church. His whole point was start being the church. Start being the church at work. Start being the church at home. Start being the church in your family. Start being the church with your friends. Now, I don't think he meant stop coming to church on Sundays, but he said, stop just coming to church. Be the church. Be a lifeline. That's why we put so much importance on that. You can be a lifeline. It was when people were serving here in this church that when I came here, I felt loved and accepted. And I was raised up into a leader because people were doing those very things. They saw me. And they felt compassion on me because when I came here, let me just tell you, I was not like this when I got here. They saw through me. They saw the good in me that I didn't see in myself and nobody saw in me. And they told me that I had a bright future. They told me that I could do things. And I believe it was because they said those things that I began to see them myself. Do that. And then when, when they did that for me, I started to do it myself. I pray for eyes to see the need. And I found my fit in the body of Christ. And I would fit in any way you wanted me to. Because, hey, I am the church. So it's not where do I need to fit in with the church. I am the church. I will do whatever you want me to do. And when I took the step of giving, that's when, actually, that's when my ministry calling started. So I can tell you from experience that, that giving is a, major, is a major player in where we're at in this whole idea of making dreams become reality. Because God can work with hands like this. He can put stuff in it and take stuff out and move it all around. But when we live with our hands like this, then we just get what we have. And we only have what we have. But when we learn to live like this and saying, okay, God, I trust you. I trust you. You can flow in. You can flow out. I've learned to get by on a little. I've learned to get by on a lot. Either way, I am yours. Either way, I am yours. Now, if you're anything like me, 
you've had a big dream. God has showed you something that you are supposed to do, something maybe really big. It reminds me of this story about a, a little girl at the beach. And there was a huge storm in the previous days, and it really churned up the water in that beach. And a whole bunch of starfish got washed up onto the beach, like, like thousands of them. There was thousands of them out there. Little girl, you know, if you're a little girl, I, I imagine you like little cute starfish. You don't want them to die. And so they can't breathe out of water. And so the little girl is like just walking by the beach and she's picking them up and she's tossing them in. And she's picking them up and she's tossing them in one at a time. Thousands of them. And people are in the parking lot. They're watching, mocking. Because little girl, you're never going to be able to do the whole thing. You are not even going to begin to make a difference. Actually, an older man comes up to her and says in the story, you're never going to start start to make a difference. Look at all these starfish. There's no way you could make a difference. So the little girl crushed, and then she perks up, and then she reaches down, and then she cocks her arm back, and with her little girl arm, she throws it as far as she can into the water. And then she looks up at the man and says, well, I made a difference for that one. And the little man, and the, the older man looks at her and says, well, you have a point. Reaches down, picks one up, throws it in. Everybody watching in the parking lot, they see now the old man who was going to go stop her started doing it himself. So everyone starts to just walk in. Next thing you know, hundreds of people are tossing starfish one at a time. And every single starfish got thrown in because one little girl was not afraid to just take the next step. Now, in that story, there's a lot of ways that we can relate. Personally, I, I know this sounds funny, but I relate a little girl <laughs> with a big dream, something huge, thousands of starfish, 4,500 starfish, and I'm just one at a time throwing them back in the water. And that's how I identify, but maybe you identify like that, or maybe you identify with the older man that walks up to a younger person and says, I've seen people try to do this before, it's not going to work discouraging, pessimistic, a little weathered by life, kind of grumpy and just saying, you know what, no, nah. your, 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 your time is best spent not worrying about it. Maybe you relate with that and you need to pray that God would soften that heart again. And maybe you're here today and you don't identify with either one of those people. Maybe you identify with the starfish. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're looking up at these two people talk to each other going, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but I wish somebody would just throw me in the water because my life is out of control right now and I just need to breathe. I just need to breathe. So no matter how you identify today, as someone with big dreams that seem out of proportion, I'm going to pray for you. No matter if you identify with, with the guy who is a little pessimistic and a little grumpy and just doesn't think anybody should be trying big things like that, but we should just stick to ourselves or whether you identify with someone who just needs a lifeline. I don't, know, I don't know what you're talking about being a lifeline right now. I need a lifeline right now. I want to go ahead and pray for you. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes as a matter of fact. I want to pray for you. God, I ask that you would begin to soften our hearts to the message today. I, I pray that your word would go down deep in our heart and grow into something beautiful. Lord, I ask that those of us who do identify with um, someone who has big dreams. Lord, if we have big dreams in the house today, Lord, I pray we would not lose heart. I pray that we would be encouraged to follow those dreams and just take one step at a time, just throwing one starfish in at a time. I pray that in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those who identify and are a little pessimistic at heart, that are standoffish with big things and trying to do too much and maybe a little hurt by previous things in life that have made us cold and callous. Lord, I, I pray that hearts would be softened, people who feel like that. Our hearts would be softened and we would be influenced by the people with big dreams, that we would be encouraged to dream again, that we can make a difference, that if we just put one foot in front of the other, we truly can make a difference. Lord, I pray for everyone here who feels like a starfish just needs to be thrown into the water.
and I have the answer for you. His name is Jesus. No matter what you're struggling with today, no matter what your issue is, no matter what the thing is that you would never talk to anybody about that here, but you know in your heart the Holy Spirit is working on you right now and you know you want relief. You just need relief from something that has been constant pressure on you for a long time and you're screaming out from inside of you, perfectly quiet and pleasant on the outside, but inside of you, you are screaming, somebody please help me. Somebody please help me. I'm here to tell you that there is only one person who can. Jesus Christ, who loves you more than anyone, chases you down, fights till you're found, leaves all of us other 99 just to pursue you. He would forsake everyone who's already doing fine just to run after you when you're not doing fine everyone in here an opportunity to be thrown into the water today. Say, yeah, I, I need a lifeline. I need a lifeline. As a matter of fact, as a symbol to God, nobody's looking around right now. If you need a lifeline, I want you to just go ahead and lift your hand up to God. I'm not even looking. My eyes are closed. Everyone's eyes are closed, but this is between you and God. Just say, Lord, I need a lifeline today. I need to be thrown back into the water today. I need fresh life. I need new life today. I need a fresh start today. I need a renewed relationship with my Savior. Forget that. I need a real first-time relationship with this Jesus I keep hearing about. You can put your hand down. You know, if that's you, if you're feeling distant from God, maybe you used to have a relationship with Him. Maybe your relationship with Him was through a family member or through mom or your grandma or someone like that but you never had that relationship personally or you walked away from a relationship you did have but you're ready to come home. I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a second. Maybe you've never had that kind of relationship with Jesus. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about a God who sent his one and only son who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life and then died on a cross for the sins of all humanity that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. And when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you never knew there was a God like that. And if that's you, this is, this is your best day. This is your best day. Everyone in the house now, if you want to restart or start a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just ask you to lift your hand God, this is to you. Go ahead, lift it up high if that's you. If you're online listening to me right now, go ahead and click below. That's me. Amen. Amen. Let's all pray this prayer together, in fact. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. I give you my sins. I give you my failures. I give you my hurt. I give it all to you. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me new. Amen. Come on, let's clap on.